This is Al Makatsu, and you're listening to Booked. Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snudden. This episode, another interview episode. Rob, how many interviews is that for this year? Is this four or five? I think it feels it's like a lot. Four or five, yeah. It's something like that. Yeah. yeah. A lot. Um, this week, Grady Hendrix. So if you were paying attention just a couple of days ago, um, we just finished reviewing the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which I believe I speak for Rob uh, and myself when I say that we thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, Grady was nice enough to come on and join us for an interview. Grady, thank you so much for taking some time out of your, I'm assuming, a very busy promotion schedule to uh, to come on and talk to us about your new book. Yeah, well, you guys are so lucky to have me. Oh, my God. I just I just sit here talking to people all day. So, no, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so um, we spent, you know, a good half hour talking about your latest release, but uh, let's get your take on the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Well, I mean, the short the short pitch is it's um, sort of a spiritual sequel to My Best Friend's Exorcism. It's not really um, s- features any of the same characters, although uh, one reader did yesterday find a little shout out between the books uh, when they got their copy. Um, but it's um, set in the same neighborhood. It's a few years later in the early 90s. Um, and it's about a bunch of housewives who have a, a book club. It's more about adult friendship than teenage friendship, which is a very different thing. And um, they they come to believe that someone who's moved into the neighborhood is a vampire and um, poor decision making ensues. Quality of life drops off precipitously. Now, you specifically mentioned in your um, author's note at the beginning of the book, um, kind of your motivation for wanting to write this book was um, and I'm just going off the, my memory of reading it, but essentially that um, uh, mothers, maybe like the work they do and, and efforts and stuff are a little bit overlooked. They're kind of an overlooked entity in the family at least their effort sometimes uh, which is way different than um like the teenagers and stuff so uh do you mind cleaning up whatever the hell i just said but like in your own words that makes sense <laughs> no i think I, I think you got the essence of it yeah i mean you know people were really down on the parents in my best friend's exorcism oh they're so horrible and they're right i mean they are horrible but that's because best friend's exorcism is written from a teenage point of view so of course your parents are horrible but, you know, the one thing I really realized is uh, my mom's been in the same book club for 30, 35 years. Um, and, and I hated them when I was a kid because they, they were just moms and they some of them were my friends' moms and people I knew. And I just thought they were dumb, lightweights who were really loud. And when they were at our house, I couldn't come downstairs and my mom would buy like cakes that they could have that I wasn't allowed to have any of. And. I just had a dim view of them in general. Like, you know, our dads went to work and, but what did they do? And as I got older and sort of got to know them as, as human beings, I I realized that they, they actually had pretty rich and fulfilling lives. And, um, you know, and one of the things they dealt with a lot of stuff that I didn't know about as a kid, because that's your job when you're a parent, right? You take these hits. So your kids don't have to, you, you are aware of all the sickness and depravity of the world because you don't want your kid to be yet. And, and I realized that like, they really, um, that, that these women were really undervalued in a lot of ways. Like you read sort of, and, and I'm not using housewife and woman interchangeably. I mean, like, you know, as a housewife, I'm saying someone who, a woman who doesn't work, she takes, or she works, but she doesn't have a nine to five job. She takes care of her family. She raises and keeps a house. Um, and I find that there's like a whole genre. It's a lot of it's literary fiction of like housewife fiction. That's really mean to housewives, to, to, to women who raise kids and, and have a family. Like mm. it, it's like, defines them by their limitations and their yearning for more and all this stuff. And, and I'm, I think it can probably be really boring to raise kids and, and tedious and, and have all those things, but they also have a great, you know, it's also equal, but different. I mean, you know, they participate in an economy where value doesn't come in money. Value comes in knowledge and relationships. You know, it's about who you know. It's about knowing this other family so that that person can um, fill in if you're sick or take your kids to school or drive carpool. It's about knowing people in the neighborhood, knowing people your family's involved with, the pediatrician, uh, your kids' teachers. Um, And also knowledge has a great deal of um, 
a value. You know, what do you do when your kid won't stop crying? What do you do when your daughter decides to stop eating? What do you do when your son is hurting animals? You know, it's 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 a totally different economy. And it's also because they're kind of outside that nine to five world, they're looking at the world and, and they're they're look and because their work isn't really valued or or put front and center as something to be valued or something to aspire to. I feel like they're looking at the world from slightly off center. I mean, the same way a lot of marginalized groups, whether it's they're marginalized by race or their gender or their religion or even their job, um, a lot of marginalized group, groups are looking at the world from a slightly different angle. And so they're noticing things that those of us like me, who's like a, a white guy with a job um, that I do nine to five, basically, um, I'm not seeing it that way, you know? Um, and so it's really interesting to to see that perspective. And, you know, I certainly remember as a kid um, in the 90s or the 80s, really, but, like, our dads would go off to work. And if you were home sick or it was a summer, suddenly our whole neighborhood, which is the same one in the book. I mean, that's where I grew up. It's like this kingdom of women and children. Like, no men are around. So if there's a guy there, what he does is really notice. Like, why is he home? What's wrong with him? So mm-hmm. I just I just thought it would be really cool to to look at that. You know, it's funny. There's there's also and one thing I wanted to do that I didn't do for the book because I, I felt like it took people out of the story too much. But I read a ton of housewife manuals, like sort of women's manuals going back to the 19th century and up to the, wow. the present day. Just because I was going to start each chapter with a quote from one of these, just sort of progressively through the years, because some of them are just crazy. But there was this great one um, that I just thought said everything. It was like from 1954. It was an article in a magazine by um, E.J. Hardy, who was a woman who was a pretty popular magazine writer at the time. And she wrote, um, see, I, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Somewhere in a New Zealand cemetery, there is a gravestone bearing a woman's name and the words, she was so pleasant. I personally can't think of an epitaph I would rather deserve. I'm like, holy shit. I can't think of an epitaph that would rather make me blow my brains out. Like, she was so pleasant. Like, someone dies and that's the best thing you can say about them. Oh, God. I, uh... I have a couple of questions. Um, I guess first, and, and maybe less serious, I guess it depends on the answer, is, all right, so how, how many vampires exactly did that book club kill, your mom's book club? Do you know? Oh, no, and they would never tell me, right? I mean, okay. that's part of that's the deal. Fair. They yeah, that's, yeah, that's fair. Let you know. <laughs> it's my other question. Listening to you, um, that was a very very insightful look at um I, I guess you know what i would call being like a suburban mom right did you, i don't know like I, i'm curious how much of that came to you after or before the idea so i know you had said you did some research and obviously that probably opened up some doors for you to think about some things so did you have that outlook on on i'll just say generically your mom and her group of friends uh as well put as you did before you started the book or was that something that developed more through the course of researching and writing the book um half and half you know i've wanted to write this book for a really really long time uh probably since probably since around the time i wrote my best friend's exorcism maybe even a little bit before and a lot of that came from getting to know women that my mom's friends with and her contemporaries as adults um, and, and also developing a better relationship with my mom. You know, I, I was um, my parents got divorced when I was pretty young, like 13. And and my sisters are all older than I am. So they were all out of the house. So she was basically a single mom when I was a teenager. And we just like hated each other and really just fought all the time. And, and it took us some time to come back from that. And, and we have a good relationship now. And and just so it's something that's been in my head for a long time. And it's stuff I've been thinking about for a while. But. I usually write books to sort of figure something out um, or to get through something. And so, um, I mean, I write them to entertain people first and foremost, but there's always something I'm trying to figure out. So, yeah, reading a lot of stuff. And and one of the things that was really hard with this book was writing parents. I don't have kids. And it was so 
hard to write parents. I mean, I must have talked. I think I did interviews, of like like spent a lot of time with about five people I know who have kids, um, and, and they were really generous with their time and and just talking to them about having kids. And for me, the penny dropped when one of them said, you know, oh yeah, I love my kids absolutely, but I don't really like them very much all the time. And um, and then and then another person was telling me how boring it was to raise kids because kids like things to be the same all the time. They like, they like that comfort in repetition. And, you know, as an adult, that just drives you bananas. Um, so yeah, I would say half and half. So I've been, I've been today, uh, in preparation for doing this interview, I've been kind of struggling with, um, categorizing you in general, but like in the two books that we've read, um, we sold our souls and this one, it seems like I could almost, <sighs> there's a lot of levity, but there's also uh, some serious darkness, and one of the things that we pointed out in our in our review of, of uh, Southern Book Club is um, that it didn't seem like a very dark book, but the dark moments were like really intense. <laughs> and so, like, how how what's what's your approach to injecting darkness into a book where, like, the general idea is we're living in the ideal suburban neighborhood, right? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't really have an approach to it. I just kind of write the way I write. Um, and, and it's kind of how I see the world. And part of, part of what I try to do is, um, that I, cause I find it fun is to apply like the reality principle to horror. So it's like vampires, like how would that work? What does that look like? And then, you know, if a vampire shows up in your neighborhood, like what, what is gonna happen like what's likely to happen and, and generally real life is pretty funny and ridiculous um and also has really horrifying moments you know i mean um you know i know when i was a kid like um we used to uh we used to love shooting bottle rockets at each other and um i remember when i was gosh 12 or 13 um my dad, after my parents got divorced, he was living in this this sort of like condo we had out at this resort island that we would go to in the summer and um, called Seabrook. And and so I was out there with some friends and he was like off at the hospital or wherever he worked. And um, we were there all day alone and like we had our bikes, but you couldn't really go anywhere. It was way in the middle of nowhere. And so we like we 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 called up all the fireworks stores we could because there were all these like woods out there. And we were like, oh, we'll have a bottle rocket war. Makes sense. We're unsupervised. And um, we found a, a fireworks store that was like, oh, yeah, we're just um, you just come out of Seabrook and you take a right at the first traffic light and we're right there. So we get on our bikes and this is summer in South Carolina. So it's like it's like <laughs> high 90s, low hundreds, really, really like 60, 70, 80 percent humidity. And we start riding our bikes. And what they didn't tell us was that. Bow Hickett Road, which is this two lane country road with no sidewalk and very little shoulder and pretty the shoulder was pretty clogged with roadkill. Like it was it was 12 miles from Seabrook to the first traffic light. <laughs> and, and then it was three miles till you got to their place. So it took us like five hours. It was insane. I mean, maybe not quite, but, but we were going, going and going. And after a while, it's like, we got to keep going. There's no point in turning back without our fireworks. We come this far and we like hitched a ride with this, like, um, this guy who's been, who's selling watermelons and got in the back of his truck and got sort of home. Um, and then we're exhausted and dehydrated. We're like, we're going to play bottle rocket war, you know? So we go out in the woods and, and I realize that the best place to put my bottle rockets is in like my pants pockets. And so we're shooting bottle rockets at each other. We all have lengths of like PVC pipe and we're running through the woods and a spark goes in my pockets and like these bottle rockets start shooting off on, in, in my pants. <laughs> and, um, so I'm trying to pull them out of my pants pocket because it hurts. And um, as I let go of them and pull, they're shooting back up at my face and stuff. So finally, I just take my pants off and like run home. And my friends were like, they they came out on the road because they heard me screaming and they they found my pants like in the middle of the road, like on fire. Um, I run home like half naked, a really long way. We were like a mile away from our house uh, in this area that hadn't been developed yet. And we decide that I'm going to get in the bathtub and they'll put ice in it. So we get in the bathtub because we don't want my dad to know because I'll get in trouble. So I've managed to blow off like three fingernails and I've, the skin's kind of hanging off my right leg, uh, my right thigh. And um, 
And then it's like, my dad's coming home. He calls. Oh, okay. I'm on my way home. Do you picking up fried chicken? Yeah. Okay. So like, he's there. So we get me out of this tub and pull pants on over this like charred, disgusting, pus oozing leg. And, and I get on the couch under some blankets. I'm like, Oh, I'm just really cold from the air conditioning. And my dad comes in and we're all trying to like distract him and, and find it really, it really hurt a lot. And finally I'm like, dad, I, I think I, I, I hurt my leg. And, he shows me it's like oh my god it was putrid so um takes me to the hospital blah blah but so this story is ridiculous um it's it's really funny at the same time the third degree burns and like the missing fingernails and stuff is really disgusting and really hurt a lot and everyone's reaction was so broken like you know one of my friends kept coming in the bathroom to be like hey I found some tuna in your dad's fridge. Can I eat that? Yeah, yeah, Jordy, sure. <laughs> hey, your dad has these canned sardines. Can I eat these? Yeah, sure. And, you know, other ones thought I was going to die. And, like, you know, it's just this ridiculous, you know, we could have easily died riding our bikes. I mean, that's a road that's, like, notorious for bikers getting hit. So it's, like, the dark stuff and the funny stuff I find just sits right next to each other. Uh, anyways, that's my long-winded answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. Yeah, what what struck us was, yeah, like, you know, I, I believe I said in the review, like it plods along at a really normal pace and there's a story and there's a vampire and it's about these women. And then all of a sudden we get to and again, without spoiling it to anybody, especially later in the book, there's an incident that happens with Slick. And I'm like, holy oh, shit, Slick. what just yeah. happened to this book? You, you know what I, I mean? Like, I felt really I felt really bad about that. That wasn't going to happen. And then it was. And I was just like, oh, boy, I really like Slick a lot in that book. And so that, I took that bit hard. Yeah. And, and and so did we. And not not in a bad way from reading a story. You want to talk about having like a little bit of a wake up call as to what the actual danger is, because prior to that. And again, without exposing too much for people who haven't read it, a lot of things are implied that they happen or they kind of happen off screen you know what i mean and then you get to this yeah. real kind of stark scene and it really kind of smacks you in the face in a good in a good way <laughs> you know i just want to stress sure. that I, I i enjoyed it from the 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 reading part of it but it was just kind of interesting to see a book turn to like anna just just that quickly so i guess that's really yeah. where we we're coming with that well you know it's interesting right i mean you know, one thing I, I've I've you, you think about is like just violence in general. I mean, like to a kid who's in a school shooting or an active shooter situation. My one of my sisters is an elementary school principal in Massachusetts, and so she talks about the drills they have to do and things. And you realize that like you're just having your day. You know, you are you have a crush on someone. You're worried about embarrassing yourself in front of someone. like your stakes are pretty low. But to you, they seem high. It's your life. And then suddenly something like T-bones your life that's incomprehensible or, or a car accident or any kind of violence. It just comes out of nowhere. You know, I mean, the few fights I've ever been in, like they seemed funny until they suddenly weren't, you know, like they were funny situations that suddenly took a turn and it's fast and it's, it's hard to keep up. And I often think that like, um, you know, people who take self-defense classes or boxing and stuff like that, the real benefit of that isn't that you know how to hit someone or something. The real benefit of that is you're used to a situation where someone's trying to hurt you or hurting you actively because that's not normal. And when it happens, it's really hard to wrap your head around the, the fact that like this person wants to hurt me. Like that's so incomprehensible to most of us. Someone along the lines of that, um, at least um, the mindset you get into uh, amidst trauma or, or horror um, was something that I, I picked up at least, or, or it struck me while I was reading the book was um, kind of the willingness to not necessarily ignore, but explain away horrible things as long as they weren't happening directly to you. Um, and, and I thought that that was uh, an interesting element. It felt very real. And it, like uh, it felt very real life that these people, when, when the bad things were happening across town, um, it wasn't as important to them. And I don't even have a question there. I just thought that that was that was a theme that ties into what you were just saying. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I find the hardest about living in New York is um, uh, ignoring people. 
Like, and, and it, it really was a tough adjustment to me to realize that living in New York, you have to, you're going to walk by a couple of times a day, someone who's in real distress and you have to ignore them. Um, and that's hard. And it, I think it takes a, a sort of a psychic toll on you. Um, and, and so I, and I deal with that in different ways, but, but like, it's really tough. And I remember I was living here for like, God, it was probably my first or second year in New York. I was in university and I was crossing a really busy intersection. And this guy was just lying in the middle of the sidewalk or the, the crosswalk having a seizure. And, and he was pretty, pretty dirty and disheveled. And, and, um, you know, it was, was in, and so I, I sort of got him up and got him to the sidewalk and stuff, but everyone was just walking around him. And I don't think that made me some kind of superhero or them jerks. I just think I didn't have that callus built up that all these other people had built up because you kind of have to get through your day. I mean, it goes against human nature for someone to say, Hey, I'm really hungry. Can you help me please? And to just keep walking that that goes against all your instincts and like, but you kind of have to because there's so much of it here and, and, and in any big city. So, yeah, I feel like, um, you know, I feel like that kind of like ignoring things that don't happen to you directly. I think that's just something we do. And I think, you know, that's why little kids get freaked out about homeless people more than adults do, because I think it's newer to them and they don't get it. And I think, you know, certainly growing up in Charleston, I think this would be true any city of, of that size. It's just that's where I happen to grow up is, um, you know, you learn to take things at face value and not dig too deep. Like, do you really want to know that your neighbor who you really like, who lets you, you know, borrow his boat to take your kids water skiing also is an alcoholic who beats his wife? Like, you know, like, is, is that your business? Well, yeah, it is your business. But, but if you start doing that, like, you know, where does it end? And then someone starts getting into your business. And, you know, so I think we all develop these blind spots and, um, yeah. The nice thing about writing a book is um, you're writing it. There are no blind spots for you. You know, you get to, to dance around in everyone's blind spots and make them seem ignorant. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, and that was one of the things that really inspired this book is um, – you know, I because I was thinking like and one reason it's set in the early 90s is I was thinking that, you know, if you're a vampire and you're smart, the early 90s is when you realize that you're going to start needing things like a birth certificate and bank accounts and a <laughs> lease um, because you're getting to the age where there's more and more computers. There's more and more computer filing and there's more and more files being shared between different government agencies and photo ID is going to become a bigger and bigger part of your life. And like, where do you have that stuff? If you're 200 years old, where's your birth certificate? Where's your social security number? Why don't you have a bank? How do you open a bank account without that stuff? And and I wanted, you know, my vampire to really realize he needs to get that stuff. And probably the place that will will provide it for him best is a town where um, as long as he's a white guy of a certain income level, people will have a tendency to accept him at face value. It's um, <clears throat> It struck me that, I guess I didn't think about the level of research that you can do in writing. And, and please don't take this the wrong way in, in writing a, a 90s book about a vampire. Right. So um, I'm I'm blown away at, at the amount that you invested into, uh, you know, into getting this right um, through your research, which made me think a little bit about the amount of research that probably went into paperbacks from hell, which is oh, yeah. a nonfiction book. Um, you know, about the paperback boom of the 70s and 80s. And it just recently came up on the podcast. We were out with Josh Mallerman and we wound up spending some time talking about those ratty old horror paperbacks that that I loved as, as you know, as a, as a youngster. And, and I'm going to assume that you did. So I guess I'll just kind of leave that open for you to tell us a little bit about, you know, your your reason for writing paperbacks from hell. Yeah, that was pure opportunism. Like, um, I hated those books when I was a kid because horror covers creeped me out. They seemed really dirty. They felt like the the freak show at the Coastal Carolina Fair. Like, like they seemed unsavory. So I read mostly sci-fi and like men's adventure, like military fiction is akin to fantasy. Um and then as I got older and I realized that, you know, I, I developed more of a taste for horror um, because as a kid, I read King and Barker and stuff like that, the normal stuff. But um, 
but I, I really stayed away from the novels. And as I got older and I started going to like, I loved paperback, like swap shops. Right. And there'd be these horror sections where I didn't know any of these authors. I didn't know any of these books. And so I just started writing about them at random for tour, uh, cause they have a great blog at tour.com. And, um, a, I needed the money. Uh, it was only like 25 or 50 bucks a post, but like I do five or six of them a month. And, you know, that was my, that was grocery and bill money. Um, but also I wanted someone to be able to Google say, um, I don't know, uh, stage fright and, and have a little more information about it out there. And then my editor at Quirk, Jason Rakulik, he was just called me one day and he's like, you know, I don't, I really love these articles you're doing. Like, I don't think we'd buy a book like this because I don't know how it would work. Like, we wouldn't just do a directory of these things or a collection of reviews. He's like, but, but pitch us something because I, I, I'd, I'd go for it maybe. And so I pitched it to him and, and they went for it. And then working with Will Erickson at Too Much Horror Fiction, he was great because it was someone I could talk about this stuff with who really knew the territory. And we sort of had these long conversations where we slowly figured out what this story was because we you know what does that book look like is it alphabetical reviews is it just by category is there an arc to it is there is there a narrative that unfolds over time like you start here and you end here which it turns out there was but it took us a while to figure it out um so yeah that was that was pure crass opportunism but God, I read a lot of books and it became it came between Best Friends Exorcism and We Sold Our Souls, I think, on my publishing schedule. And both those books were under contract. So this I only had 10 months to do. And I had to read a few hundred books to do it. It was it was really intense. Um, I'm writing another nonfiction book right now, and I hate it because um Nonfiction's hard because every word has to be true. Like fiction, you can bullshit. Oh, they got in a car and they drove over here and there were lots of French fries. But uh, like nonfiction has to be true. And it's really, it's really, really hard. So <clears throat> after reading a couple hundred of those books, did you find any particular author or a couple of authors that really stood out above the rest in those categories? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been working with Valancourt to bring a lot of this stuff or some of this stuff back into print, like Elizabeth Ingstrom stuff. Um, I had read a bunch of really low grade bu books before I read her When Darkness Loves Us, and it blew me away. Um, uh, Joan Sampson's The Auctioneer is amazing. Barry Wood's The Tribe that I think I mentioned before, uh, or maybe I didn't. Um, but it, I, oh, I'm looking at a copy of it on my shelf. That's why I think I mentioned it before. Um, that's really amazing. Ken Greenhall's stuff is absolutely stupendous. Michael McDowell. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, but the other thing I realized is I've got one of my guilty pleasures I, I discovered was, um, animal attack books. I really love animal attack books. Like, like just the idea that like caterpillars or dogs or ferrets or rabbits or pigs have just had it up to their back teeth with us. They're like, that's it. That that's the straw that broke my back. It, it's over. And then it's just full on. Like, you know, they go, they go hard ass motherfucker after us. It's just, I love that. I also really like animal attack videos. I don't know why, but, the, but like when you see people like teasing a kangaroo and then it just kicks their ass or like they're slowly approaching a deer and all of a sudden it's just brutalizing them. I just, I love it so much. <laughs> Um. I actually had I actually tried to convince before I'd actually done much movie work. I tried to convince someone years ago to come in with me to make a found footage animal attacks movie. And what we were going to do is license animal attack footage from around the world, like really good stuff, like that bear attacking the woman in the train yard in Russia and all this stuff. <laughs> and then we were going to get actors to dress as those characters and try to match the, the technical quality. And so it would be like, we'd have a little bit of the character before and after, and then oh, they're getting attacked. And like, I thought it would be such a great idea. Just like all over the world, every animal, just had it with our shenanigans and it just drops the hammer i still think it would be a good idea um <laughs> but i i it's i used to review movies and one of the ones i got to review a screener because i was the low level movie reviewer at this daily paper called the new york sun so i would get the stuff no one else would want to touch and this screener came in for this movie called rise of the animals and i think you can find it on amazon prime these days and like 
the cover was like a movie poster, but it was drawn in magic marker, like freehand by, I guess, the director. And it had this squirrel holding an eyeball, like a little acorn it was about to chew. And this movie is phenomenal. I mean, it's just <laughs> shot on digital video. And it's, it's I think, probably um, the the loose change I could find in my office right now is a l- probably a little bit more than the budget they had. And like, but, but these guys have so many filmmaking chops and such heart and like the animals are basically puppets, but like that movie starts at 11 and ends up at 16. It's got one of my favorite sight gags of all time. N- nothing n- too much praise is not enough praise for rise of the animals. <laughs> I don't even know what to say after all that. Um, I'm sorry. I really no, I mean, no. That's I'm wonderful. Sorry. I just <laughs> some sometimes you have a really good idea of where like a question is going, and then sometimes you find out that you were really wrong. No, that's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I realize this question is probably about I don't know six or seven months out of date now, but um, I, I think maybe you just kind of touched on it. Did you read a lot of like the Don Pendleton, Mac Bolan executioner stuff? I'm referring to a post you had on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Uh, in no, September. Man. Oh, my God. So this great guy um, sent he he asked for a copy of my last book and I had an extra one sitting around and um, I had met him before. And I said, like, yeah, sure. I'll send you a copy. No problem. And uh, as a thank you, he sent me freaking like 35 executioner books. So they're sitting here and I'm dying dying to sit down and just read one after the other i just man i'm so swamped right now like all i can read and watch is for work like people are watching tiger king and i'm just so jealous um i i'm really just kind of trapped i mean on the one hand it's great i've got work but they're like um no so i'm dying to get into those there's a guy david alexander who wrote these um post-apocalyptic men's adventure books called the phoenix series are are my my sort of ultimate men's adventure books they're just amazingly batshit crazy but i've never done a deep dive on a series like the executioner i, I can't wait i uh i grew up with those books and i don't How know are that they? I ever they're they're wonderful i mean they're 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 comfort food to this day you know i mean there's yeah. uh lightly threaded throughout with like a bigger story but they they all kind of follow the same the same story arc yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm actually in a, an executioner group on Facebook, believe it or not. But oh, my God, that is so hot. I, like when I was in, sexy. when I was in eighth grade, um, I at that point, I was kind of starting to dabble in like reading Stephen King and stuff like I'd moved away from the Hardy Boys. Um, and I was at a garage sale and just picked one up and I was like, look at all these guys and they all have guns. And it was actually a, a tangential series called Phoenix Force that um, ran alongside those guys. And that's how I got sucked okay. into it. But. Like some of my fondest memories are like once a month, those would come out and my I would wait till my dad had to go to the bank, which was down the street from a crown books kind of dig and dating myself on what year that might have been. Um, and, you know, and the excitement at going and picking up like two of these every single month. So it was uh, it was interesting to see that in somebody else's, you know, again, I'm in the executioner group. Right. So that's all people sharing old covers and cover art and people have bought the original art. It's just weird to kind of find it in someone when that's not the the. The, the thing that's linking you together, I guess. So I thought that was what that was, was pretty cool. What mm-hmm. was Crown Books? Oh, Crown Books was a chain bookstore. <laughs> um, I would assume nationwide because I know I'd been to several of them. I don't know if it was just like a Midwestern chain, but it was uh, the the precursor to Borders probably. But that would have been in oh, yeah. okay. uh, the mid-80s. Yeah. Okay. Probably so, into yeah, the early 90s. It might 90s, just have yeah. never come to... Yeah. yeah, it might just have never spread to South Carolina. That's really cool. I guess there were I mean, there probably were these regional chains all over the place. Um, I know when we had to look back. What's yeah. that? When they when they closed Books a Million bought a, a few of their locations. Okay. And I believe they were also a national chain. But then obviously it, we wound up getting to borders and they're gone now, too. So all we have left is Barnes and Noble and, and a lot of great independent bookstores. But yeah, well, you know, it's the, funny, though. Oh, go ahead. No, after you. I was just going to say, it's funny, right? Like, I loved books like that growing up. Like, one of the books I loved was this book called The Park is Mine, which is basically this Vietnam vet takes over Central Park and, like, booby traps the whole thing and then just slaughters cops for the rest of the book. It's phenomenal. Um, But no one really publishes stuff like that anymore. And um, I I think it's regarded as a little antisocial. And I feel like there's always this this 
problem people in publishing are trying to solve, which is how do you get boys to read? Because they really do stop reading at a certain age. And and on the one hand, there's video games, right? Like if Call of Duty, looking the way it looks, had existed when I was a kid, I would have been done. Done with it. Screw books. This is awesome. But another part of it is that I think the books that get published aren't what books want or aren't what boys want to read. I wanted to read stuff that was antisocial, that was violent, that was, you know, like I wanted to read stuff that felt real and true. And, and you know, I don't think that that's something that a lot of editors, especially YA editors, feel comfortable publishing or or advocating or really even respond to personally. Um, you know, I, it's my favorite books when I was 12 were like Stephen King, uh, whatever, whatever's going, probably Night Shift at that point. Um, the Robert Heinlein, those juveniles he did that were super technical. The Park is Mine, uh, world books about World War II and the Anarchist Cookbook, because I loved reading about guerrilla warfare and like how when like the the third world war came and the soviets invaded us i would like make man traps and punji sticks and learn how to make a homemade play more mine like i i if i, if I was a 12 year old boy those books aren't really available to me and i wonder if that's one reason that reading drops off so much in uh in boys I have had all of those same thoughts. I actually owned a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook when I was probably like 13 or 14. So. It's so good. Yeah. All right. Before we uh, we let you get on with the rest of your life, um, you have written several screenplays. Um, well, Rob and I both recently saw Satanic Panic. And really, the one thing we always want to ask is, what's the difference between screenplay writing and novel writing, if you had to break it down to a few sentences? Yeah, well, books are interior, right? So it's, um, you, you know what the person's thinking. It's all about their their feelings about the situation. But with a screenplay, everything's exterior. Like, you can write stage directions for how someone's feeling, but you've got to figure out physical ways to show that. Um, and so that, for me, was a huge thing that I took from screenwriting to books, which was you got to find interesting ways to show people's interior states. Like, um you know, there's a thing in books where something happens and someone goes numb and it's the most boring thing on earth. Uh, someone going numb is just tedious on the page. And so you've got to <laughs> find better ways. And that's one thing screenwriting really taught me. I mean, it's so much more economical. Um, and the other thing with screenwriting is every scene has to have a point. Um, you you have to every scene has to be a little set piece in a screenplay. Um, it has to have a beginning, middle, end. It has to go somewhere. It has to be interesting to watch. And in a book, you can write people are driving and thinking or they're sitting around talking or there's a thing like I try to keep up with comic books for a while because I was a huge comic book kid. And like the fifth or sixth time I was reading a comic book recently, like what, like a Marvel or DC thing. And there were people walking down a hall talking or sitting in a room talking around a table. I'm like, what? This is a, you don't have a budget. Why can't this happen in <laughs> space? Why can't this happen in a volcano? Why is this so dumb? Um, and I feel like people get a little lazy on the page. Whereas, um, you have this economy of action with a screenplay where if it's on screen, it has to be interesting. Um, if you've got a character you're going to introduce, that actor wants a really good introduction for their character. They want some badass stuff to do. They want interesting lines. They want to go down like a champ. And and I feel like that kind of sense of drama is something I really learn screenwriting and and hopefully try to apply to books. That's awesome. Um, in, in kind of in the same vein, um, I, I just looking up, kind of getting to know more about you in preparation for this conversation. Um, this happened to go on IMDb, and I noticed that practically like everything you've written is some at some point of, of development. Um, so I guess I'm wondering how much involvement do you have with any of those projects, or is that something you can talk about? No, yeah, sure. I mean, very little, honestly. Um, some of them I do, some of them I don't. Uh, most of the ones I do have involvement with haven't been announced yet, but will be hopefully in the next little while. But a lot of that stuff, you know, you're the low man on the totem pole with a lot of these deals. Um, the the writer's like the least important work guy in the room. Um, and so, like, you know, my best friend's exorcism, like, that's sort of like every now and then I'll get an update about it. And 
the movie version. And I, I feel like I'm getting a card from my kid who's gone off to college. Like, well, glad you're still alive. <laughs> you know, nice, nice to hear that you're still eating, I hope, and, you know, staying healthy. But it feels very, very distant. So, you know, I, I hope the, the final product's good. But, yeah, I, I've got nothing to do with them. That's so unfortunate. And and both Rob and I love movies and TV shows, although our tastes vary pretty greatly when it comes to that. But I don't know, like the author of a story to me is always the most important. And it's always so difficult to like change my mindset when I hear, <laughs> you know, the writer is the least important person in the room because, you know, you're the creator. So it's just I, I don't even have a question there. It's just such an yeah. odd thing. It's an odd perspective shift whenever I hear it that I have to remember that the <laughs> person who's most important to me and in the scope of a project is is likely less important to everybody else that's involved yeah it's weird it's um well you know and and even the screenwriter is is very not unimportant but an early stage in a movie and it's funny to see how much a movie changes between like the first pitch or the first draft and what gets up on screen and what I've really learned after doing it a couple of times, only a couple of times, but like that's actually been produced. But but going through this process is what people need from you are characters and structure and and because they're going to change the set pieces. They're going to change the dialogue. They're going to change a lot of stuff, but they want interesting characters and they want a basic structure um, that they can then do other things with. Um and I think that just comes from the old Hollywood thing where, you know, it was writers were just, you know, all hired by a studio and, and projects would move around between them and they were put on and pulled off and all that stuff and things were rewritten. But, um, yeah, being the author of the book is interesting because, um, yeah, I, I agree, things have to change. And my feeling is always um, I feel like when things adapt a movie – they either don't ch- or when 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 movies adapt a book, they either don't change it enough or they change it too much. And it's rare it hits that sweet spot like like um, the Zack Snyder Watchmen, I thought was such a literal adaptation of that comic. And I just really didn't gel with it at all. It didn't just wasn't my thing. It felt kind of DOA for me. Um, but then watching the TV version, that's radically different. Um I really enjoyed because I was like, oh, I like seeing what you've you sort of filled in all these these spaces you found in that. Like, that's what I really like seeing. It's, you know, I'm a big fan of the P.G. Woodhouse, you know, Jeeves books, the Jeeves and and, uh, Worcester books. And I always feel like the adaptations of that are too faithful. Like, I really want to see someone tear one of those up and just go go full punk on it and really not not literally aesthetically, but really just like tear one of those things apart and make it work as a movie. Because I think like I think someone like Edgar Wright would be the right person to do that because he would be able to come up with a visual language that would be as as manic and deadpan and over the top and sort of surreal as P.G. Woodhouse's writing style. Okay, you just gave like you just gave me something that I had no idea that I needed in my life, and that's an Edgar Wright <laughs> uh, Jeeves story. Uh, oh my god! That, and That'd now I'm going to obsess with it. Like that would be the best thing I've ever watched. Um, <clears throat> one thing I want to like as, as you're as you were talking about kind of watching someone work with uh, your 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 baby a little bit. We just talked to Josh Mallerman um, a few days ago, and he told a story about how uh, when he was screening. At Netflix, they were they did a screening of Bird Box, and he watched it. And at the end, he said, "Well, I wonder what happens next." And that was kind of a cool thing to hear him say. Like the story that someone made off of his story inspired him to kind of wonder, "Where does this go from here?" So, um, yeah, that was kind of a nice result of of having someone else take the helm of of what he created. Yeah, no, that's really really cool. I mean, you know, my thing is a lot of the movies I've worked on so far, um, you know, I'm really self-critical, so I had to sort of be forced to watch them with an audience, which was hugely educational. But for me, I'm the bummer in the room. All I see are the places I screwed up, you know, the places I could have been better, the place. And so like, like who wants that? Right. They've just seen a movie. They want a few drinks. They want a good time. You got this guy going, Oh, that scene was so overwritten. I can't believe I did that. I should have, you know, it's like, they don't want me around. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm dying to get to the point where I see something that is adapted from something I've done where I can just, feel more of a sense 
sense of distance like Josh did and be like, oh, cool. Let's see what they did. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely his his perspective on things is, is always pretty optimistic. And so that was a fun thing to uh, to hear someone say. Um, so we talked a ton about the stuff you've done. Um, and I know that you're in the middle of promoting this book. So it's probably the only thing that's on your mind. But um, what's uh, what's on the horizon for for you? If there's any projects you're working on that we can. Expect yeah, to see so. Soon? Uh, so I'm working on right now a nonfiction book about uh, kung fu movies coming to America in the 70s. It's going to be a little like paperbacks from hell, but it's like, Jesus, we've done such a deep dive. I'm working with this guy, Chris Pajali, who has this huge collection of stuff, and um, he knows this history really well and has done a ton of interviews. So it's it's tough to put together, but it's going to be really fascinating. Um I think, and really heavily illustrated. Um, and we've already got a publisher for it, and hopefully it'll be out later this year, but who knows right now. And then I've already got a book on the slate for 2021 and for 2022 uh, novels that'll be out, I think, in the, in the early part of the year, both years. So I'm doing revisions on the 2021 book, and I got to get started on the one for 2022. So, um, you, you know, publishing so weird because it's so old fashioned. It, it, it happens on a very old fashioned, mm-hmm. slow moving timetable because it involves shipping heavy pieces of dead tree to different places where they're <laughs> handed out to people. And um, so the publishing schedules you know, you're you're a year and a half, two years out, you know, so you're always so like when a book comes out, it's way in your rear view mirror. You kind of have to remind yourself about it. It's really crazy. But that being said, yesterday and, and part of it's the coronavirus thing because i just it's it's hard to be in new york right now you just like, like i my exposure to it's so ancillary yeah. but it is really tough to be in a city you love that feels sick and um and so part of it's sort of like i feel like everyone feels a little exhausted by that but also part of it yesterday really hit me hard i mean it was um the book's out which is great but um it's kind of brings to an end two years of my life. I live with that book, Southern book club. And, um, it felt pretty, it just felt like a piece of my life coming to an end. And, and I mean, not like I'm, I'm dying or something, but just like, it really hit me a lot harder than I expected it to. I've had the hardest time doing anything today, like putting on my pants. I was like (laughs) big victory. (laughs) There's a little bit of that, uh, going around for all of us, I I think. So, Grady, we want to thank you for a great interview and for taking time to come on and talk to us. We're definitely looking forward to uh, books in 2021 and 2022, which is kind of cool to know. So thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, y'all. Okay, um, I know that we always praise the author after we get done with an interview, but like, man, this guy really brought uh, some really entertaining answers to to our questions in this uh, interview. Yeah, I... um... Yeah, it's like I said before, you kind of know, like we always have a feeling on where an answer is going to go when we ask a question. And I'm just fascinated by the the um, number of things that, that he seems to be very adept at. So um, very cool. I definitely uh, think that we will be seeing him again on this podcast in the future if for nothing than for us to have a great conversation for an hour or so. Yeah, there's, um, there's some times when you, you get an answer that's like, levels of magnitude better than the question you asked and i feel like this was the entire interview dude when he said pg woodhouse i kind of went up here we go here we go (laughs) i can scrap whatever else we have on this list i know where you're going for the rest of the rest of the conversation so that was it for me Um, anyway big thanks to great hendrix uh another awesome uh awesome interview uh go back and listen to our review of the southern book club's guide to slaying vampires if you haven't heard it definitely go pick yourself up a copy you will enjoy it rob Tell everybody what's next. All right. Uh, up next, hopefully not just a couple of days from now, because we've been releasing so many episodes back to back. Uh, next week, you will catch from us a review of the book The Ancestor by Danielle Trussoni, um, which uh, I know, Livius, you've already finished the book. And um, I'm actually about halfway through it right now, and I'm, I'm very interested to see where this goes. Um, uh, I don't know if what I'm going to say is a spoiler or not. I'm not going to say it. It's not going where you expect it to go. There, I'll say that. All right. All right. (laughs) So until then, thanks as always for listening. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep getting Edgar Wright to make the P.G. Woodhouse movie and reading. Oh, God.